Hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to Table Breakers. Tonight, Jade is with family, and if you have any happy thoughts, any positive thoughts, go ahead, send them to Jade as he is doing the, the husbandly thing to do. When one member of the family is down, the other family members stand up and carry them, and that is exactly where he's at. Good luck, Jade. You guys got this. All right, in his steed, please welcome our guest, DM tonight, the Crafting Gamer. Hello. How are you doing tonight, sir? Pretty good. Fantastic. I don't want to have you get all anxious here. There you go. Okay, so tonight's story, or tonight's uh, work that we're going to be working with is going to be Poisons and potions in tabletop role-playing games. As an Italian, I approve. Baron G Rock, are you yeah. the are you the originator of this particular topic? Uh, I think it was one that was suggested a long ass time ago, and it just kind of came around. So I don't remember who suggested it. Hmm. It might have been a jade. It I sounds do. like a jade. It sounds like a jade. The reason why I went with the racial statement there about the Italian, uh, that's an Italian I approve. There's quite a bit of uh, poisons used in the uh, old world of Italy. And for those of you that are fans of popular cinema, about 20 years ago, there was a movie that came out called Brotherhood of the Wolf or Pack de Loop. And the wonderful Monica Bellucci is in that movie, and she says something rather revealing about Italian history that many others in modern culture don't realize. Florentine women, Florentine women, uh, there was a large poisoners' guild with a bunch of associates and such, and we talked about guilds a couple weeks ago on on gatekeepers, and the poisoners' guild would actually administer to the wives of Florence um, a poison to give to their husbands in the morning before he left for work. And they would also supply the antidote, which was to be administered at supper. And that was how Florentine women kept married and not widowed. <laughs> There's a uh, great line from Churchill uh, about poison. A woman says, if I was uh, your wife, I would poison your tea. And he says, ma'am, if you were my wife, I would drink said tea. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get completely right, but it's... Oh, it's, no, you, you got it pretty right, right on, on the dot there, Connell. You, and then, you did very well with that. And then I'm reminded of the scene from The Princess Bride. <laughs> <laughs> the billions. Inconceivable. Uh, I don't think that word means that. what you think it means. Yeah, that, that's that's another good example of of uh, Italian Sicilian culture making its way to the the modern era screen. And damn it, I wish we didn't. <laughs> uh. So we have or baron in his free time because he is a very busy man has came up with some questions i think somebody is asking not me not this guy i think shadow should do it he's so good at it you mean because they're so similar to the last ones i read i you know if the shoes fit i i do have them up if you like i can do so uh, before we before we get started on that uh let me paint some bills here real quick. For those of you that like great coffee, I mean great coffee, let me introduce you to my little friends. This is the Fowler's Makery and Mischief. This is a good little caramely medium roast. It's got a little bit of sweetness attached to this, but these beans are a fabulous way to start your day. You grind these suckers up. And this, this is how you do it, kids. This is one of the signature blends, I believe. Fowler's Makery Mischief. There's some other good blends they have. 
morning reaper is actually my favorite but blackout coffee great people strong constituents of uh, strong proponents of the first amendment uh, amendment and most importantly the second amendment because when the first amendment fails go to the second anyway we've got some information here and uh Barrett G Rock has a code there for a uh, discount. If uh, it won't accept that, it should accept that. Keep that code, Baron G Rock, available, or keep this in your, your tagline. Either of those should get you a discount there. And sign up for their texts. Sign up for their text. Right now, they've got a special on chocolate, on, on their hot chocolate stuff. So, it's not like it was last November, but it's not November yet. I expect in November they're going to do a massive hot chocolate sale. Last year they did a 60% off. It's freaking great. Now, no, those are not coffee drinkers. They do sell tea, and the tea is, I've been told, quite amazing. Well, hold on. I believe I have some of the Earl Grey right here. Or oh, the Grey of the Earl. Yes. Yes, this is their version of Earl Grey. And uh, this is a really neat peachy sensation black tea. My bad. I had the Earl Grey in the kitchen. But this, this stuff here is damn near gold. And you see the little peach shavings right there. This stuff is freaking great. I drink this hot. I like it hot with honey. Careful, Bruce. Like that looks tea. like a particular item. What? Careful, Bruce. That looks like a particular item. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I, I, got, I got a video uh adultified because of doing something similar listen <laughs> if they if 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 the youtube censors suck that bad we will take this show to rumble exclusively and get the dan bongino discount that they give us and uh, no, we will for, be happy. for a second i thought i was sitting next to an asian restaurant i thought i heard dog <laughs> i know right <laughs> meets back on the menu boys so anyway, yeah, they have tea, hot chocolate, and coffee. Blackout coffee is your 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 stop. There are other good coffee brands out there, but that's the one that primarily I'm either chewing or drinking. I can tell you they're great. I hope they get chocolate coated coffee beans soon. Maybe I should go suggest oh, that to them. Espresso beans, chocolate covered espresso beans. Yeah, I love chowing on those. You know, I was the one kid in my yeah. family. It's like, ooh, little coffee beans. Who wants to make Connell take a nap? Oh, wait, I do. Hey, Connell, have some coffee beans. It works every time. See, I love those people that coffee makes them fall asleep. Coffee makes me get amazing. Like, I should be sucking on coffee right now. Hold on. Okay. Um, while I'm getting prepped... Uh, Kai, haven't said hello to you yet. How you doing, sir? I'm doing okay. Fantastic. You look like you've had a day like what I had. Yes. Okay. I had I a shit want, day. I want to brag about my 21-year-old stepkid for half a second. Uh oh. Uh, this month is bit my my birthday was early this month, and he didn't give me a birthday present. And Mike, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. The kiddo goes out. I can't remember where the ring went. Went out and bought me a cigar that was old enough to smoke itself. <laughs> it was an 18-year-old nice. stogie from Gurkha's, and oh my God, was it amazing. So, I, you know, as a scar DM, I figure I should brag, A, about a really nice cigar, and, and B, my stepdad, uh, my stepkid did something really cool. Sounds like you got a good kid there. Laszlo is a great kid. I need to get him uh, in the same room with Jade so he can get all this car talk out of his system because he'll go on and on and on, and, well, I don't do cars. It's like Jack in politics. You just, you know, um, you crank his gear a little bit, and you watch him, beep, 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 and you just walk away as some other person now has to deal with, by the way, I'm like, uh, <laughs> you poor death bastards. It's like St. Kai. St. Kai over there. We get on a topic where he hasn't been St. Uh, St. Uh, Kai-ish here recently because he gets all his ranting, his 
scripture out on a uh, Saturday show with Bruce that everybody should be out there watching. Actually, the, the reviews from that aren't coming back bad for just me and him. And we're like the two made for radio guys. Um, I'm telling you, like, we're actually getting some pretty good views and people are talking about it. So I'm pretty happy. I enjoy watching it. I'll even comment a few times if I actually have something intelligent to say. So I don't say much. I don't know. Kai didn't yeah. rant on my show. No. Yes, Baron. I said that one up just for you. Well, you have to pay Kai the correct amount of money, or you just have to threaten to take away all of his loot when you're the DM, and then you get the rant from hell. <laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 no. You, you, you don't. You don't give him loot. You just make him suffer at coppers per adventure. And then after about 150% past his level up point, when he's working on his next level, and he's like, I, I has no money for, for training. I has no money for training. How am I supposed to enjoy this game if I have to continuously flush money out my asshole and not pay for food, starve, get training, go through training on an empty stomach? How am I supposed to live? This is not the way a man is supposed to live. I'm about ready to, to, to launch myself through the DM screen and strangle your neck. <laughs> That's how you fuck your then you fuck your campaign world. It's time to instigate a a revolution that will burn it down. I will find a dark god that will that, that, that will acknowledge my existence and then I will invoke its powers and then figure out how to open up hell and obliterate whatever beautiful world that you've written for yourself, whatever masturbatory little fucking fit fuck shit face hole that you made yourself some little final fantasy <laughs> little lord of the rings happy land that you decide that this is how you think the world is supposed to be and how you're going to write this thing no it's going to be i'm going to literally try to to, to, to derail it in a way that and will go shit i'm taking notes and then wow i'm so glad the I ultimate in my game the the ultimate uh, slap in his face is as soon as he makes contact with that dark god, you end the game right there. I will fucking find somewhere else to be. You know what? I got other things to do tonight. I could fucking be anywhere else on this fucking planet besides your shitty table. Eat a dick. Go go sit there and have a little circle trip with your little fucking friend group that you have. Your little happy little group of friends that all sit there and go. We're all happy. We're playing together. And go fuck yourself. I'm gonna go find something else to do somewhere else. I want to see do it with yourselves. I want to see Kai back in high school. I want to see when a teacher pissed him off. If he was able to keep the embodied rage intact into his gut, because that's where men keep rage. They keep it in their gut. Or did Kai say, "Well, fuck this"? By the way, bitch. <laughs> I, I got questions. Well, the thing is, is that it's either that happens or the uh, the when they start to get the just the 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 hint of the domain play, just as as Kai's fingers just start to tingle because oh, I can get out the the, 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 the all of the, the spreadsheets and I can do all the things and and we can we can know how much how much a, a how much wood for sheep there is. And and don't even have to worry about playing, you know, Catan because I have a spreadsheet that tells me in my kingdom what it is. And then you just take away the spreadsheets and say we're not doing domain play today. Now that we poisoned Kai against us, let's get this guy. Let's get this going. <laughs> I didn't say a goddamn word. You are a goddamn <laughs> piece of shit fucking player. You got you got to create Wallace level fucking bullshit custom rules because you can't play like a goddamn actual person. You can't play fair. You can't play like a nice person. You can't actually read the rules of good play. No, you got to sit there and fucking masturbate to how much you got to create custom rules. Stack the deck so that way you can masturbate to how much. Look, I'm winning now that I've changed every rule to be in my favor. Wow. I went for the table, but unfortunately your fat fucking gut is on top of it, and I can't fucking do that. I, You know what? Go sit there with your little fucking goddamn little core of yes men, your five fucking yes men who will suck your dick and, and worship your toes so that way you can play your game so you always win. If you surround yourself with losers, you'll always win. 
I wonder how much. So where that makes that. your that makes your ego feel really fucking good, doesn't it? Man, I bet you file so good that you have to make house rule after house rule after house rule. So that way we can't actually have any fun. You know why I fucking run my own game with my own friends who are actually cool and I give them a lot of a lot of fun things? Because I've been around too many of you fucking useless shits who think that you have to have a nice little jokey game about yourself. Man, I'm having so much fun laughing and pissing people off. Or how about you just fucking put on some goddamn big boy pants and learn to play a goddamn fair game and that if you lose, you lose. If you win, you win. And we all have fun. No, you're going to whine like a little fat cunt and you're going to go over there and bitch to, your, bitch to your friends and make sure that the guy who beat you using the rules can't win a second time. If he beats you a second time, you change the rules a third time and a fourth time to the point where, man, all I can do is nothing useful. Eat a fucking dick. I, I okay. Now that we've so, got him awake and he's ready to go. So yes, this is what happens. This is the effect of mixing a brew and it blowing up in your face. So the, we we've done this with Pi as as the catalyst here, and we love him because he's amazing. I was calm and having a nice day. I was just a little tired. That's it. Hey, David Guile. Yeah, you showed up to Massive Kai rant. Kai, Kai's been at that. Actually, I think that's a regurgitated speech he's had at uh, frequent tables from 1999 to 2013. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can roll that one back, actually. You can actually start, you can start those at about 1997. No, no, 96, 95, uh, 95 or so. Through right. 2013 okay. or so. Okay. Um I, I knew it around 2014, your life went through a, a bit of a, a change, a good change. And after that, like, I've really not heard you um, unhappy with your table because you run your table. Maybe yeah. That works. Yeah, uh, yeah. David, Kai has played with some terrible people. Baron and I have played with terrible people. We've. I'm sure a lot of you out there have, have played at some tables where you felt like you were the butt of a joke, level after level, after game after game. And uh, that's that's the problem that I've had a lot of times with quote unquote house rules or somebody improperly using the written rules that doesn't read the rules so they think that the way they misread rules is how the rules really are. Anyway, we're here to talk about plots, or uh, not plots, poisons. Yes, poisons and potions. <laughs> Break out the miscability charts, guys. <laughs> you should have your own your own separate table. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, guy. Um, you may have you ever thought about making an only feed account? <laughs> no. I I'm willing to bet that there's some people out there. <laughs> I don't know why, but when you say that, my first thought is Kai has big old hobbit feet. I was thinking that too, to be honest. Oh my God. <laughs> and, and you will never know. I'm okay with that, though. I'm very much yeah. okay with that. For that, we thank in, you. Yeah. The intro to his page is the greatest adventure. Okay. There, there's a song from. Our childhood that I could sing, but I don't want to do that. I I want Kai to realize that we sometimes, my friend, um, we do need to have a certain mindset out there. That way, we set the tone for a a night. And I believe for a topic like plot uh, for uh, poisons, and I th I am saying plots and poisons because that was a drow book for three point five. I've got really good book know. actually. I thought you just suddenly got a case of dyslexia. No, it's uh, but our topic tonight is poisons and potions, which every fucking time I sit down at somebody else's table, I get a new spiral notebook to copy for this campaign's poison rules, and that sucks. Soy based Jeremy, you know what? If I had the means, yeah, we'd be doing it every other Saturday. <laughs> You don't want to do it for too long because I was at the Decatur Athletic Club. I was a member over there for many years. And then one day in 2006, they shut down the, the, the jacuzzi. And apparently some guy jacked it up to ultra setting 
And he sat in it for about an hour and a half. He was silent. And uh, at about two and a half hours, somebody came by. Hey, you doing okay? He didn't respond. So they stopped the, the jets and they pulled him out in pieces because he came out in pieces. Like you grab him by the shoulder and arm and like his torso separates. And then as you're grabbing stuff out, as you're I grabbing his bits. Of was his name Stuart? No, no, should have been. His name should have been Stu. As you but but eat what probably looked like him. Awesome. Yeah. I was thinking that Bugs Bunny out uh cartoon back in the day where he gets into a pot and he thinks it's a hot tub and they had carrots and celery. Yeah, yeah, that's about <laughs> as far as into that cartoon as I'm going because everything else is almost a like hate crime. No, well, my favorite reference to that will always be Chicken Joe from Surf's Up One. So, poisons, poison, poisons. How do we use the poison correctly, boys and girls? And like David says, Delvers has its own rules for poisons. So if you have a copy of Dungeons and Delvers, make sure you do read over that before you blast through a poison section. I'm just saying. Yeah, giggle juice. You have to hydrate. Hmm. An idea. Yeah. Yeah, that guy came out in pieces. They closed down the, the jacuzzi for about maybe a week. Ain't already over. So what? You need a half an hour max. Um get that man soup out of there, give it a quick rinse, fill back up. Back to business. That's like I'm not, the ass shit. This, 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 my friend, is Illinois, and any chance they have to put up a, a, a cone anywhere, <laughs> even in the middle of a private business, yeah. any yeah, time can put up a cone orange. and a caution, caution tape, you're, you're, you're going to see the caution tape and the cones come out, okay? <laughs> any reason. <laughs> so... Should we start? What am I doing? Doing because it don't look right. Uh, I'm actually making a. Uh, uh, Your palette splotch board for the new paints that I got in, so that I can actually kind of understand what they look like over a white primer, so that I can kind of memorize them and, and get used to a whole new line of paint. They don't, always, they don't always look like what they look like at the bottom or kind of at the top of the bottle. And I tried putting a little white dot of paint here and then putting some paint on it. And it's just not enough to be able to see it from like two or three feet away, you know, arm's reach where my paints are. I get a kind of rough idea, but <clears throat> I want to be able to memorize these. Yeah, that's just some weird shit, man. I can think of some gruesome ways to die, but... Mm. The giant stew pot on uh, ultra agitation, not really my way to go. All right. So, have you, uh, everybody ready for their uh, session for poisons and potions? Absolutely. All right, go ahead and let us begin. Bring forth the questions. You want me to read them? Yes. Are right. you sitting? Are you sitting? Okay, ah. okay. Not a problem. All right, guys. What are some common types of poisons and potions in tabletop role playing games, and how can game masters and players? Use them to create dynamic and engaging game playing experiences. I'm going to start with uh, Eeny, Meeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. Let's just go with Bruce and go around the clock in clockwise fashion. I actually don't like to make things up or alter things a whole lot because typically when I start doing that, um, because my players have everything saved on a 
hard drive in the cloud. Um, should ever anything need to update, <clears throat> I have to wait for them to get their said character off the cloud and a usable state so they can view it. So whenever I like to pass out potions, I really don't want to alter it from the, the system I'm using. And that doesn't mean just Pathfinder. That's like any system. If I was running Dungeons and Delvers, if I'm running 3.5, if I'm going with Rifts uh, Palladium, or Palladium Fantasy, which is a much better game than, than Rifts, if I was doing anything like that, I actually want to go with the actual item from the book. I will give it sometimes an alternate description because in the majority of games for fantasy, usually they tell you no potion ever looks alike, even though whenever you are playing a game like, say, Diablo, You'll collect 50 identical little health vials, which give you 50 hit points every time you right-click this one. And it disappears. It magically disappears. It, it's, it, it, the entire glass thing disappears. You imbibe it all. You shit up glass later. It's great. And hey, Matt Brininger, um, it's it's really impressive that you can do that. Now, there are, are times where, say, like what Flady says, where you have a sneaky old salesman come along, and he sells you a bunch of stuff which you think is a core rule book or a, a, a hardcover that everybody's got the book. So you can just turn to it. It's right there in the middle of the game. They say, I'm going to use this. And that's when you as a DM have to remember, hey, I sold this guy a, po a potion of flatulence, but it's disguised as a potion of levitation. What? It's a, it's not a potion of levitation. You You didn't identify it right whenever you bought it. What? And now, well, you might have a little bit of humor because there's a guy that has a potion of flatulence coming out of his asshole or coming out of his pores if he farts through his pores. Well, however it is, now you have a guy that he's a little upset with you as a DM that this is in your game world. You've altered the game. You've made it to where he's a butt of a joke. And a little bit of trust between you and that player might be eroded. Because now they can't trust any potion vendors. Anytime you have an event vendor come along, people are thinking, oh, God, this guy's going to fuck us. Because anytime we have an event vendor where we have to have an actual role play session between me and the vendor, everything I'm buying is a joke gimmick. Like, he, he sells me a rose, but instead it's a joy buzzer that I just received a die eight fucking electrical damage. Or I just got pricked by a thorn on this rose he sent he sold me. And I'm going to have to save versus double X poison. And I'm going to strip down into my nethers. And I'm going to shit out 100 hit points of damage in a cone 90 degrees for about 45 feet. And the world will suffer. You know, whatever it is. So I don't like really altering a whole lot of things. I don't like doing event vendors a whole lot. I, I really, I know this sounds lame for some people. But I don't want to do event vendors and what I want to do, typically, whenever the players have earned their time to where they can rest, relax, use their gold the way they're supposed to, I give them the core rule book or I give them the, the list of items they're allowed to buy because maybe it's a small town. You can't buy a chain mail plus four here, sir. This is peak in Illinois. The most you can get is a masterwork chain mail. We don't sell magical chain mail here. And, you know, I've just insulted Connell, but the, con sorry, Connell, that's that's your peak um, I wouldn't even say it's masterwork. <laughs> well, it's not from the quarry. So anyway, you, you just have an event vendor. David Guile is a time where you have a vendor come up to the players and there's a role playing session for something that should be easy to procure or something that the players could, if they had invested the time into learning how to craft themselves, they could do it themselves. But event vendors often are used to like sell potions of tonic which are disguised as potions of healing or potions of levitation which are actually potions of flatulence or maybe you have a really vindictive vendor that he'll sell you all the normal shit until you get down to this eighth item on your list where oh yeah that's the potion of of uh, moderate pure moderate wounds and that actually has got the right potion in there but around the, the glass top if you have a perception roll of a 30 when, right before you drink it, um, you'll notice that it's glossing a little bit, and that's actually a contact poison that's meant to go on your lips. Roll for uh, fortitude, and you do that. You know, event vendors 
I feel are okay to use every once in a while, but don't make them to where they're 90% of the time joke vendors where they sell crappy items or, or misleading items to players. You can sell, you can give items to players in like loot piles where they find it and they find out, well, it should be a potion of healing, but spoiled. So it actually is like a, a potion of illness. It's like a potion that gives you a negative two on everything for the next four days. Make a fortitude save after two days and see if you continue diarrhea. You you let people discover the, the not so core rulebook items themselves. Don't make an event vendor to where they have a guy comes up and he's a snake oil salesman. I don't like doing that. Because one, you you'll, you'll lose trust in your players, or they lose trust in you as a GM, and two, it really just makes it look like if you do that too often, you want your players to suffer, like right in front of you. Don't do that. Like do it maybe once a campaign, and when I say campaign, once every three years. Don't do it that often. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Sure. Kai. Question again? Yes, please. Damn it, right, bunny yeah. trail. What are some common types of poisons and potions in tabletop role-playing games, and how can game masters and players use these items to create dynamic and engaging game-playing experiences? My very question on that, my very comment on that one always has to come down to is what variety of – I am – I think the average person when they're going out shopping for poisons should not be looking like I like having a lot of poisons and a lot of people a lot of chemistry and creativity in terms of how to make a more a more deadlier poison but those shouldn't be on the common market but you should know that they exist people shouldn't be wandering around going oh, it's a poison no they're used they're used commonly you're going to encounter them you're probably nobody like half the monsters are poisonous in any way so why is it i mean you should be able to just go down to the i'm not going to say at the corner market but hell half the poisons out there are, are medicines so uh, the only difference between medicine and poison is simply the dosage and <laughs> well, a lot and, of poisons are actually used as medicine right and so i guess i like having the ability to most people will go, oh, it's it's a complex thing, and most people don't deal with it. But it's out there. It's available. There's somebody in town probably who knows how to mix them. The good stuff might be a little harder to get. The really good stuff might be really hard to get. And in the hands of evil, nefarious underworld people or a corporation or a guild, or you might have some crazy guy who walks into town going, you know what, I hate this castle. And then suddenly the entire castle dies. And yeah. And the thing is, we deal with with either magic or nanotech, which is just techno magic, and other weird things. So yeah. I and how I'm used to GMing is is there's a lot of poison out there. And sometimes that good old fashioned classic type B e might show up. Everyone, no, all poisons do stat damage there. Not this one. What's that? Type E poison, my friend. The good poison. The good stuff. The kill a dragon stuff. Oh, yeah, I still like that kind of stuff. And you might encounter it. But then again, you might also encounter mass use of war crimes gas or spicy wind. Really spicy wind. Um, because, you know, massive irritants or... Um, people bleeding from their eyeballs. These are things you're going to encounter and should encounter because mankind is one of the most terrifying monsters you're going to encounter. And I like the idea of leaving vast tracts of land dead behind me because a chemist got you, a, a alchemist got loose. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of books on poisoning um, in, in fantasy and in cyberpunk and in modern fantasy. Yeah, I'm sorry, or, or urban fantasy or modern day grungy, we're in the modern day. Yeah, poisoning, uh, mass poison, chemical warfare, and, and biological toxins are definitely out there and should be used, should be known. But most people will probably go, I have no idea, poison bad. 
Don't drink the don't, don't drink bleach, kids. Now there is a place where we can advocate for kids to go have Tide Pods. My bad. Yes. My bad. Only in Minecraft. Hey, hey, I like Minecraft. I do too. Crafty, same question. Uh, yes, I'll be happy to read the question. <laughs> what are some common types of poisons and potions in tabletop RPGs, and how can game masters and players use these items to create dynamic and engaging gameplay experiences? Well, as a GM, I didn't spend that much time with... Uh, healing potions most of the time it was uh, either natural healing or magical healing but i did uh, a lot of the players have a lot of antidotes to venoms and poisons especially given the fact that one of my favorite types of poison is a very uh scarecrow from dc approach to things mostly insanity poisons most of what i did was one shots for a while so in I didn't want, since most of it was also trying to introduce people to Palladium, I didn't want to kill off their character the first time they played it. So Insanity Poison, it, eh, Insanity poison, uh, Poisons became my thing. One car one person actually failed their role so badly, both their Insanity check and their Poison check, that they actually gained a permanent Insanity from it. But, uh, I, I, I like using the, uh, poison trope not under too much thing like oh you just found poison oh you just found poison no 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 there's only one or two traps that actually have poison in the whole thing most of them are meant to be insta kill or slow you down i might do a little bit differently now but that was back then so i always made sure that the poison was a good time within a dungeon so it's uh fun for the players but hopefully not overwhelming on the same hand because it's not like they're just going to go running straight into another trap and instantly get their head cut off type thing gotcha how about That's you Connell? yeah nice how do i wait read the question again <laughs> what are some common types of poisons and potions in rpgs and how can game masters <clears throat> excuse me and players Use these items to create dynamic and engaging gameplay experiences. Well, when it comes, let's do the potion part. I'll, I'll answer the potion part because the poison is a whole different ball of wax. Potions, when I'm running a game that's not 5e, if I'm going back to Pathfinder, which I prefer to play in the Pathfinder world, um, I think I got this from Jade. When it comes from a potion that you buy from, let's say, a cleric, a healing potion, there's no rolling. It does max. It does max. Whatever it is, it just does max of it because you got it from a cleric. You didn't, your buddy down the road didn't make it. You didn't get this from downtown Willie. You're, you went to an actual church, temple, mass, whatever, and you bought it off the them. And in theory, they should know how to make these. So I think I got this idea from Jade and I always enjoyed it because it just, simplified it. it we didn't have to wait for somebody to go, i only need to roll x and yeah it just keeps the game moving okay. so that's how i do my health point po uh, potions most of the potions more or less the same way unless the player makes it then you roll because just because you can make a potion does not mean you're proficient enough in it the same way uh clark from a church so that that's all he does all day is make potions all that you know you can make bread or I can go to the baker. I'm going to bake because 10 to 1, he knows what the hell he's doing. That's always been my point of view when it comes to that stuff. And I don't like putting potions and treasure. I think it's asinine. <clears throat> potions should be in a cupboard. They should be in a box. They should be put up. Just not looming there on a great big fucking pile of uh, copper. That's dumb. That's just really fucking dumb. Yes, Kai? You don't trust ibuprofen that's been stored in heat or unknown conditions for up to three to four centuries? No, no, I do not. Okay. I just suffer in silence. As for poisons, my poisons are fairly common to the world. I don't, you know, 
it, um, what the poisons are is a different question, but you, you can find your poisons at your local tavern because they serve poison all day. It's called domestic? I'm just saying, there's sometimes there's imports. Yeah, pilsners. <laughs> That's just diabetic piss. <laughs> pilsners aren't bad. It's the IPAs you got to look out for. That's being raped in the mouth by a pine cone. Um, so I treat poisons as you just can't get them everywhere. You actually have to know somebody. You have to be part of some kind of guild. It's just, oh, I'm a rogue. I'm going to go buy some poisons. All right, where? Well, at Walmart. No, no, they don't sell. Yes, they do, but they, uh, it's not the poison you're looking for. So that's how I handle poisons and potions in my world. It's not... I do potions a little bit more generous than I probably should. And poisons, you, you can't go to your local whatever. And it's like, well, I'll take two two, po- uh, two vials of purple worm poison or and three vials of black lotus and, you know, whatever. You actually have to know somebody or a, be part of something to be able to, to get a hold of them. Does that work for you? Absolutely. Baron, how about you? So, so with this, the, the, the big thing is that, you know, the, the potions are not available to everybody. Just because in typically in the worlds that I run, the raw materials are not that easy to come by. You have people who are dedicated to go out and, you know, Collect those those items for those uh, for those healing droughts and, and whatnot for the uh, for the church. You know, you have those those folks out there. We're out there, you know, collecting the nightshade or you know the the purple worm poison in order to you know bring back that so it can be curated into the poisons. The you know, it's not something that you that every Tom, Dick, and Harry is going to know where to get it from. You know, you're, you're going to have to have a rogue who is in the guild who who knows a guy. It's like, I know a guy. I got, I, I got a guy. I got a guy for that. And, you know, he goes and, and makes contact, sees what he can do with it. It's not going to be something that's going to be in great supply. These are going to be things that are going to be used. You know, this isn't going to be something that you drench your blade in every... Uh, Every single fight that you walk up to and you know, stab, stab a stab an orc in the heart every t- and, and use that poison that poison on your uh, on, on your dagger every time because you know that it, it only it has a shelf life of you know maybe an hour or two and you know it, 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 it's not going to work after that. Because it's going to get all kind of gunky. You know, there might be some residuals, but really, it's not going to really, really have that big of a impact. So, and along with that, the you know, I kind of follow that same thing that you know Jade has done is especially like with healing pops. You know, if you go to to the to the uh, the church, the uh, the uh, clinic, whatever you want to call it, that that you know the, the healing gods or, or the healers guild or whatever have, and they hand you this. Here, they, here, drink this. Earth, okay, you get a you know you get max points back. Congratulations, and you know it, it's it's going to be you know what it is. So the Overall, you know, in order to, you know, get those dynamic and engaging uh, gameplay experiences with that, one good way you could do that is maybe they got, maybe instead of being able to purchase those those healing pots that they need before they go into the, the next big, uh, big part of their adventure, they have like one. Well, you, you got more than one person in your party. Probably want to go out there and see what you can do. Y'all get out there and, and see what you can do to rust some up. 
So they may send you out there to go find some and, uh, you know, be able to uh, get some of those uh, those nice herbs in order to help with make it. Or, you know, maybe they they play escort to the guy who knows where where what he's looking for to get it. You know, you can use those type of things, and those are nice little side quests because then, you know, you come back with a lot more than what they expected. All of a sudden, now that potion dealer is now indebted to you for, you know, helping, you know, not only restock, but overstock. So you might get some stuff at a discount. So, I mean, th th there's a lot of different things that you can do to, you know, make it part of the story. I like it. For me, uh, one of the most common potions I like to hand out when I do hand them out, and mind you, that's not like a common thing. I don't have like a lot of magic item shops, was the heroism and superheroism potion. Back in the day, if a fighter were to drink one of those, he gains a couple of temporary fighter levels and the accompanying hit points. So that instead of me having to hand out lots of healing potions while they're in a dungeon or an adventure, which I find to be kind of a little too video gamey, um, this way, it, you know, it, it imagine, you know, spinach and Popeye. You down the potion, you, you, you buff up, you beef up for, you know, a couple of turns, which is, you know, a crap ton of, you know, melee rounds. And then the hit points that they lose were the temporary ones that they just gained. That way, I don't feel like I have to, you know, constantly put potions of healing, you know, in their path so that they can keep on actually playing versus, uh, well, we're in the third room of the dungeon and we're completely out of heal spells and any sort of healing capabilities. It's time to go back to town. Um, I really kind of hate that. And this way, they can just drink them, go in, and when the battle's over, there's a good chance they never actually took any real damage and you know you can figure out the, you know the math from there it, it just worked and for me that that, that makes the game a little it. bit more realistic as in you know there's not you know healing after every freaking combat and you know it just that, that also to me I, I can't recall a single novel where there was you know more than one or two actual instances of any sort of magical healing whatsoever. The heroes just took their licks and, you know, by the time the story was over, the adventure was over, they're running on the last couple of hit points, but no worries because that part of the, the story is over. So I'm going to roll on into question number two because we spent almost an hour on the first one. How can game masters, and I'm actually, I'm actually going to start with you, Kai. Sorry, I should have said that first. How can game masters and players use poisons and potions to create moments of tension and suspense in combat encounters? And what are some strategies for balancing the power and impact of these items in a way that feels fair and engaging for all participants? Wow. That's a long one. Honestly, because of the price and rarity that most of the because unfortunately we tend to play games that that poisons are really mostly a joke. The more I, I, I the more I'm playing with basic bitch uh, bitch gaming, the more I realize that most poisons are actually an inconvenience at best. So the I, I the balance is inherently that the out of the book affordable poisons are barely worth even acknowledging they exist. I mean. It's like, oh no, you stubbed my toe. I've inconvenienced for two hours. And it's not really, it really doesn't, the balance and fairness, of, like, I guess because of the fact that we've taken, that most of the more modern poisons that you see in gaming tends not to be what I would call um, scary or even life threatening. Because it's like, oh no, I make a poison check every 10 to 15 minutes. 
And I, if I make a, the, the rules are so pathetic these days to make poisons and either, and the expensive ones, the good ones, you get one dose for several hundred or a couple thousand gold pieces are so prohibitively. So I can either buy a major gear upgrade, buy a house, buy a fortress, or I can have <laughs> a major, or I can buy a major poison that will, that if the GM rolls a nine or higher, we'll ignore it. Yep. So which do I bother to do? Hmm. So the inherent, I, so I guess because of the fact that they are by rules, almost a joke, almost worthless. You need to go back to older editions to find one that's not really a joke, not really I know first was great. First and second are amazing for poisons alone. There's wow. a reason why you I are preaching to the choir, my friend. I understand this because yep. there's a reason why I have AD and D second type E poison is the poison that we used for everything, and why we had sleep poisons that actually make you go to sleep, or and some of the poisons make you go to sleep forever, <laughs> or. Or you fall over, you fall over convulsing because you just took twenty to forty more points of damage. Because oh god, I didn't die, but my body is 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 feeling horrifying. There's a reason why I have it. I have rules for various and more advanced, more nastier, horrifying poisons because I want poisons to be scary. Now the moment that you, now the moment that you make poisons actually intimidating like they can actually kill you not just make you feel sick for an hour oh the next two days i have an upset tummy my con score went down oh i've got an earache your decks went down uh i feel a little weak yeah, strength strength loss man I, my head's a little foggy because I, I i got poisoned oh my intelligence and wisdom and I'm slurring my speech because I drank too much alcohol on charisma damage and charisma intelligence wisdom damage. And that's all you really get to see anymore. Well, in the event that you somehow failed 19 saves in a row, you might die from it because your stat went to zero. And that's kind of bullshitty, kind of lame. And that's really what most of the poisons were. Or, But we lost like the poisons that, that freeze you up that turn you to stone, that make you die. But if you bring those back and players start suddenly having to go, oh shit, poison, suddenly that poison dagger in the room becomes a whole lot more interesting. That evil villain who's about ready to unleash a horrifying poison that will kill most everybody in the um, in the city block becomes an actual point of fear rather than uh, everyone's going to feel sicky. For, uh, sick for if we don't clear the area in 20 minutes, <laughs> I, somebody might die. But we don't worry. We have like 30 minutes to to to, to give out the um, the antidote or bring everybody out of the poison cloud and make everyone hope they can p pass a fort save. Oh, man. But it really just means if you want to make them interesting, you got to bring the lethality back to it. And sometimes that means your evil villain's a poison master or the guy who's working for the evil villain's a poison master, which then brings you the ability to bring a whole lot more like chain of events if your players like forensics. Now, if your players like procedurals and forensics, you can have a whole lot of fun then, but you got to have players who are actually um, able, to, uh, able to put two and two together and get four rather than two and two and get puppy dog. And... And yeah, so it really just comes down to if you want if you want com I poisons to actually matter, you gotta make them scary, and most of the time poisons aren't. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna address this thing that uh, Mages just, just put up uh, for ingestive poisons. If you you know drink or eat them, uh, the minimum starts out at if you save, you still take ten. If you yeah. fail 20, all the way up to if you save, you take 30, you fail death. Die. Yeah. And then, uh, and then stabby potions, if you save, you take nothing all the way down versus if no save, it's 15 to 35 to death. Now, in yeah. AD&D, 35, 40 hit points 
that can kill a 10th level fighter, believe it or not. Not, I know. not a great 10th level fighter, but a 10th level fighter. So, or you can cripple them so badly from yeah, one they're, dose. They're, they're, I, they're, they're, you, you, because well, if you think about it, if, if a fighter suddenly realized he lost half his hit points, he should be thinking about retreating, not pressing the attack, unless it's a do or die kind of situation. Right. Now imagine the modern day poison, which only which does like a D6 con damage. That's the scary thing. Ooh, the scary one. A D6 con. D, a D8 yeah, that's weak. That's weak as that, that's and yeah, and okay. if you don't get if you don't go to your cleric to cast remove poison in it after after a minute or two, you have to roll another fort save. And take the damage again a second time. Ooh, if he rolls maximum, if you if you wander around for a whole minute and don't do anything, you might if he rolls maximum, fall over hurt. But that's not that. But let's be honest, most of our dice don't roll that high or that hot. Let's be honest, most of our dice roll average at best, below average if we're GMs. So at most, we're giving we're inflicting. An upset tummy on most G on most players, mm -hmm. and most players are like, "Oh man, I need some tums. I'm sick. Oh, I might be sick for a week. Someone cast restoration on me. Yeah, I'm better now. Yeah. So real quick, I want to say hi to uh, a couple of folks in the chat. Welcome, Janet. Welcome, RPG Grandma. Obviously, uh, Mage's musings. If you guys haven't checked out his his channel and Janet's channel and RPG Grandma's channel. What are you guys doing with your life? Eagle Rider, I, I don't believe I've met you, but nice to meet you. That's Rosetta. She's a real sweetheart. Okay, cool. Like I said, nice to meet you. I'm going to go next on over to TCG. I'm going to read the same question out for you. How can game masters and players use poisons and potions to create moments of tension and suspense in combat encounters? And what are some strategies for balancing the power and impact of these items in a way that feels fair and engaging for all participants? Uh, when it came to poison, my players never really used poison, so I have no real experience about that. I would, I would like to think it could use it in a dynamic. My players would think of ways of using it good, but I don't know. I never had that experience. As for my, uh, for me, I always use poisons in traps. I never really thought about using them on knives or as a, a weapon of, other than for traps. So I, how I would do that in this particular instance wouldn't necessarily be the insanities. It would be probably along the lines of paralyzing and I, I definitely now I definitely use fatal poisons. But I'm not entirely sure what poisons palladiums have. I, I just used one. I may have basically been a homebrew of a poison for the longest time. Yeah, I can't recall too many of the uh, palladium poisons, to be honest. So, what about potions then? Potions. Uh, well, potions also weren't too common, but when I did use them, I made sure my players had to use two actions, one to fetch the potion, one to uh, drink the potion. And I did it once towards the end of playing, so I don't know if I would have used it more than that, but where during that time someone had a strike of opportunity on you because you're just standing there drinking a potion. Okay. Players didn't complain I mean, about it, at least. I mean, it does make sense. Uh, a lot of people would probably be uh, weary of ever using them again without having someone, you know, take their spot. You know, hey, block for a minute. I need to take a potion kind of thing. Because you're absolutely right. Just, you know, pulling out a, a you know, because I always assume or, or imagine potions being like, like your typical stereotypical test tube with a cork. You can just thumb off and glug real quick in one swig. So, yeah. Kai, you wanted to add? I, you know, because of that exact problem, because we had, because of the old rules of, of I got to spend time actually doing that thing, my players have come up with so many dumb, creative ways and engineering disasters that will 
that solved that problem. A lot of a lot of my players ended up looking like like rift juicers, having healing potions on like injectors that they were just like, I'm hurt, inject. Like main line, you know, they have like mainline IV. Well, you didn't like, have any of the, the 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 hats with the potion bottles in them, you know, like. Oh, no, some people did that early on. People did that. One guy created a still suit that that it was like the Dune still suit that um okay. it was filled with healing potions. So that way, when he got hit, it would just break open a vial and just spill the healing juice all over his body. And I'm like, like, oh god, you a you stink, and because you're wearing because. I, oh my god, you're really weird because you're, you're wearing a still suit made out of literal healing potions. Like, yes, hit me, hit me. I heal when you hit me. I'm like, like, only for a while. He goes, I don't care. It's a while. It's hilarious. I go, you, you're retarded. But no, when you have like injectors, like like, like IV drip injectors, I'm just like, I'm just like shooting at them. They're shooting themselves up with I, I with combat. They go, how much of combat buffing potions and healing and healing potions? Like they're just like. I, why? Why do this whole pull out a vial thing? No, that's for that's for when you're downtime. No, I want I want like ready active. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Uh, moments. Yeah, it, it it was kind of unusual to think that you could get away with it, and or that if you know any any monster or opponent worth its salt saw you digging for a potion, he wasn't going to press it. the attack take and take full advantage of that situation, and, and instead of hit you smack the potion out of your hand or something like that. It just, it, it seemed a little far-fetched and probably why we never actually read about it in any of the, you know, classic novels or even the comic books, you know. It, 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 it's, a it's a purely gamey kind of situation. I think uh, just, but we did it for decades, did we not? Yep. So, again, give me just a second. My page. I'm going to go on to Connell with this one. Connell, you following along or do you need me to read for you? I need you to read for me. Okay, I want to tell you a little bedtime story about a, a man named. Shh. How can game masters and players use poisons and potions to create moments of tension and suspension? Suspense, excuse me, in combat encounters, and what are some strategies for balancing the power and impact of these items in a way that feels fair and engaging for all participants? I want to take you back to the 90s when Angel Dust was a thing, or PCP, where these these guys would take this magical poisons, because drugs are poison, and they were superheroes for a while. So you are running a campaign and the big bad i don't know not even the big bad one of his generals or lieutenants is like you know i think i'm going to produce this drug this poison and give it out to uh, a small town to see how it works well now the whole town is you know tanked because of said drug so now your heroes have to go figure out okay where did these drugs come from or this poison and what effects does this poison have on the now brain dead uh, NPCs that they're having to deal with? So I know that's a little bit dark, but I, I think that would be an interesting well, way. No to... darker than, than a certain alphabet agency has done in the past. So there's multiple different ways to use uh, poisons. I was in a campaign years ago where the DM let me play a cigar merchant that I had special cigars that had uh, sleep poison uh, in between the uh, the roll. So if you smoked it, it would, uh, you would have to make a con save and a fort save or you'd pass out. Using poisons in unique ways is not hard. It's, I mean, I don't think it's hard. You just have to think a little bit outside the verbial bottle. And if you can do that, you can introduce uh, a, a series of horrible events that your players have to deal with because of it. I mean, uh, I know I joke around about cocaine bear a lot. But that's another example of how, what does poison does to the wildlife? How would it affect a community? Cocaine bears nothing 
compared to tortilla shark. <laughs> I'll take your word on it. I, I, I mean, so I will, I will use, I will use poisons and unique ways. And to my opinion, unique and devilish uh, points of views that will make the players really, really hate me and having to clean up, you know, this mess. But I, if I'm going to do it, that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm not, you know, ooh, the de- the rogue, the evil rogue has a his dagger that is, you know, has green stuff dipping on it. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just going to shoot him. What do you mean you're going to shoot him? Well, I'm not going to let that son of a bitch anywhere near me. I'm going to shoot him with my bow or my crossbow or fireball or magic missile or disintegrate. Mm-hmm. A hundred different ways not to get in range with the dagger with the uh, green grippy stuff off of it. Um, and for potions, does this also cover potions? It certainly does. They all do. <sighs> potions are just kind of potions. I, I Once again... I, I think you have to go to like clerics, but there's other potions in healing. There are what uh, uh, bears endurance, owls wisdom, or whatever. Uh, de- uh, you can find those. Maybe they're not so much at a magic mart, but maybe you have a witch in the village that makes, or a druid that lives outside of town that makes this. That you know, I'm going to pull a page off of Max uh, Legion of the Mist uh, book where. You actually have to go talk to this guy. and He's going to give you a list of things to make said potion. So your your de- your bar can be a little bit more a silver-tongued bastard or so forth and so on. It's just not going to be, welcome to Magic Mark. My name is Ash. How can I help you? Uh, no, you have to work for it. Well, believe it or not, in uh, AD&D, a seventh level magic user could actually make almost every potion in the book. Just not, you know, not without getting the ingredients, of course, but. But how much time did you have uh, being, I, I imagine I, I'm still piling through my second edition library that I was able to snag for a good price, but how long did it take you to get from level one to uh, level seven and how much resources did you have to burn? Uh, that's an impossible question to ask the first part. The resources, um, you would definitely not be required to spend probably more than half the gold that it would cost to make said potion. Otherwise, what would be the freaking point? And you all, everybody knows that if you sell a potion, you're going to get half the listed value, which means you should that's probably be trying to negotiate with the GM that it should only cost you about a quarter of that provided you have the ingredients. Now, that's the tricky part oh, yeah, because yeah, there, was was a, there was a nice list of the ingredients in the Dungeon Master's Guide of potential re- required ingredients to make said potion. Baron, you look fairly excited. You okay over there? No, I'm fine. All right. I had a cramp in my leg. I had to move. Ugh. Eat more bananas. Um, potassium, boys and girls. The word is potassium of the day. That keeps cramps away. Well, sometimes. Uh, I find out that uh, dill pickles, like the, the kosher dills, are best for me. But yeah, I, I make I, sure I, you eat your daily pickle Rick or or pickle Vic if you if you wish. And, we uh, can do. Uh, but yeah, I try to keep things okay. interesting. I, I when it comes to potions and. Poisons because we have been overly waterboard. No, overly. I don't know what the term I want to use is. It's just you pick focusing, up a blood. Focusing and, on the poisons. Yeah, and potions. You know, well, all I have to do is go here. All I have to do is go there. No, let's make this a little bit more interesting. You know, as a paid DM, I want to make it them feel like their the their money is being worth giving it to the shop. Kai, you wanted to say something. No. No, Kai. Mm, yeah. I'll hold on. I'll hold on. Okay, because you had your hand up. I don't want you to have to wait forever. I'm going to go uh, next to Baron. Kai's going to chew my uh, chew my head off. I can see, see it now. <laughs> That's if you have a head left by the end of this uh, stream. <laughs> Last time I invite him to go see a movie. No. 
So, you know, the, the, you know, when, when you have things in combat, one of my favorite, uh, things, and it was actually, it's actually, I would say it is kind of an alchemical would be a, like a, which would kind of fall under the, the, the potions and things like that is like a tangle foot bat because you throw it and it just goes everywhere. It makes things sticky. You know, the, the thing is, is that, is that looking at, at the whole potion making, it does encompass the alchemical things too. So when, when you're looking at ways of, you know, uh, tension and suspense, there's a whole thing of, you know, you know, the, uh, the, I, I'm reminded of of, uh, of a game that I believe Bruce ran, ran and it was uh, seeking cloud is a uh, a privilege, not a right. And you know, so therefore, you know, it's throwing those things out there when, and from the GM side, when the players are least, you know, least you know able to grasp what is going to happen. Because the beautiful thing is, is I'm going to use three, 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 five right now. Is that yes, you can set cut up a guy pretty good. He's going to have as long as he's not healed. You could theoretically throw a potion in here or uh, a uh, a vial of poison at him and not have to hit him. You can hit his square where it will splash. And he will get the effect of the poison. So therefore, you know, you don't have to necessarily mean, you know, don't necessarily have to make a big show of it. This could be a thing that, you know, they throw a potion. It makes this great big fog and the bad guy gets away. You know, there, there it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a, a oh, I, I'm using this to to uh, eliminate you from the face of this earth because most bad guys are nar very narcissistic and they are thinking, I can't be beat. So I don't need to keep beat you or whatever. I just need to make you look like a fool. I can make you look like a fool with me getting away. So therefore, you know, if, you, if you're looking at a lot of these different types of things with the potions, you, you know, look at the alchemical side. You know, with the with the actual poisons themselves, you know, you've got several different ways of you know doing it. Darts are huge, and darts can really be used with the whole uh, whole thought process of you know you've got your goblins. You know, first level goblins. <laughs> you know, boom, they hit you with a with a with a with a poison dart. It's not gonna. It's not gonna hurt you. It may make you feel drowsy. It might. It might make you. It, it might make you. You know, the wizard not be able to maybe lift his arm. Wait, I can't lift my arm. Uh oh. Wizard can't cast. Now comes a whole different thing. You know, something. You know, you know, a poison could theoretically also be like a muscle relaxant. That was one of my favorite things to do. Is a muscle relaxant on a dart. You realize that if you hit a fighter with a muscle relaxant, there was a joke in there, folks. They can't get it, get their arm up or anything yeah. else up afterwards. And uh, you know, but if you think about it, you know, unable to, you know, get, you know, just with a muscle like the muscle relaxant, being able, to, you, know, you can't necessarily get that get that arm up to swing that sword or, or use that dagger or you know you could use it definitely to incapacitate a spell cast so i mean th those are other ways that you can think of uh, instead of using you know your your normal poisons look at things that will do hinder. things to incapacitate and hinder exactly Bruce, would you like me to read the question for you? Yeah, because I'm thinking about the bunny trail that 
Garrett and then Kai went on and on that. I'm like, shit. <laughs> okay. Good. Bruce, how can game masters and players use poisons and potions to create moments of tension and suspense in combat encounters? And what are some strategies for balancing the power and impact of these items in a way that feels fair and engaging for all participants? I wouldn't do, I, I wouldn't really introduce poisons and such until after like third, fourth level in a game. Because for the most part, whenever I'm running a game from super low levels, I'm trying to get the character that's behind the character. I'm trying to get the player to actually understand that this is not your 17th level character you had. The world does not awe and quake and thunder uh, with every step you make. Now you're just a regular guy. You're barely more competent than the average working stiff in the majority of things you specialize with. And uh, if you try something out of your specialty, you're probably going to be no better than the average working stiff. So please step smartly. And for the first level or two, that's that's all I really want to do. Uh, to keep things on a, uh, I hate saying the word fair. I really do. Yeah, I'm not a but, fan of it either. But to keep things. Life is intrinsically unfair. Yeah. Um, to keep things on, on this basis to where, you know, you're, you're, drip feeding things into your game in an early level uh i would i would pop a a goblin hunt on the players around fourth level and you know players most time whenever they're like fourth level we give them a goblin hunt they're like wait what we're hunting a goblin we should have done shit at first level what do you mean we got to hunt a goblin down unless somebody's watched like some really good Jap anime called Goblin Slayer. They they have no idea what they're in for. You know they they really they really don't. And I would I would use every bit of uh, treachery and and cunning to be expected out of a twelve intelligence creature with a, a fourteen wisdom. I would pair those two two together and, and let the goblin just completely screw the players over. Just 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 let him play cat and mouse with the players. And see how well they do with a, a foe that's very resourceful, with a character that that with that does not want to get caught or injured or discovered. And so he would be doing a lot of strikes from the shadows. He would be trying everything he could to to set up positions of advantage first, and then he'd launch a couple darts tipped with a, a muscle relaxer or sleep dart if he thinks that the wizard will fail to save. He'd do things like that, but he wouldn't be trying to go for the kill right away he'd, he'd want to wear the party down maybe hire his buddy the a kobold set some traps for him and they would they would pretty much run the party ragged through a, a dungeon and just try to be one step ahead because goblins even though they're small they're very quick at 30 foot base movement you do that sort of thing to a party and you let them really just kind of screw the party over i know that sounds bad i don't want to deliberately hurt the party but you give him the opportunity for like the first two hours he's throwing muscle relaxers to the party so you take a d2 strength damage you catch six to six of those you're going to minimum six strength is going to go away if you fail your save and the the role for the save for a lot of people i mean not everybody plays a fighter so not everybody has a a plus 20 percent plus 50 percent based off your ability score rolls just to roll better on on poison a lot of people want high constitution they can't have high constitution because their character is not set up that way they they put all their their abilities in into intelligence or dexterity so for the first two hours you'd have a goblin go go around and just work on debilitating the players to where he would have a fairer fight he, he would get rid of two of the characters ability to have a dexterity modifier for the first two hours have a have another poison dart have another poison dart dipped in centipede blood have another poison dart dipped in this blood or that blood and he'd be doing darts for the first two hours and then he'd run off you know and party tries to go after him and they discover he left a rake on the floor ow that sort of thing and he'd be very resourceful so you just give them the opportunity to possibly evade 
the the uh, traps he leaves. But if you're following him, he's going to mine the area for traps that he leaves in his wake. And I think that would be that would be not a fun adventure, but that would be an adventure to where you make your party really struggle to get success, which is get rid of this go- this goblin. And of course, if he does manage to break the party up, and you know, one party member happens to fall asleep because they lost all their dexterity points, or they lost all their strength, and they fall down and they faint, well, maybe the party will come across their raped corpse later. You know, I mean, if you already split the party up, you might have a situation where he does get his way with a character. And goblins in my world are like the goblins in Goblin Slayer; they are very horny. And there are plenty of half goblins born to many wards around affected areas in the overworld later on, like six or eight months, where you have half goblin Ken that might show up at an orphanage or some such. I wouldn't recommend you do that all the time, but I would want to have players in other campaigns experience fear, hatred, and loathing towards the goblinoids as I that I feel because I think that they are a really good race to actually do that with. Um, if you have a goblin poisoner alchemist that's just running around like a flipped out ninja and he's dosing on uh, extracts to to make maintain his movement and dexterity up, even though the, the players are trying to be hot on his tail, you have a very good chance to where he will easily dominate the party if he is allowed to get one thing off I'm just saying that that might be something that you have happen i don't awesome. know what your particular game would have shadow on and that, that's um, i was going to go into that real quick because i do want to keep this moving along okay. um I, I like the old adage what's good for the goose is good for the gander players drinking potions all the dang time well what happens when they, they meet a group of orcs or or goblins or whatever, and they all pull out a potion and slug that before combat. Just think of the the aforementioned potion of heroism. Suddenly now you've got eight goblins all spinached out and ready to go in and maybe even exceed the player character's levels or giant strength or fire resistance or some other potion that, you know, the players would be like, oh, crap. Now we're not going to, not only do we got to fight these these critters, but we're not getting that as treasure. Kai, you've had your hand up and down for a bit. Would you like to add to this particular segment? All right. There's this wonderful little thing that if you play like Ultimate Campaign slash Kingmaker and it has various third-party supplements that increase it, there's, an, there's a trait that goes into that that's, that allows you to equip military units with, with potions. The idea that they are that your people are have combat potions, either healing or offensive or poisons that and it costs resources. And you start to start to contemplate the idea of what goes into maintaining the ability for a large formation. Because because you mentioned the idea of an entire orc tribe, you know, popping potions. At that point, you have to start going, okay, because where are they getting all of these potions of heroism from? Because you can't just have it have everyone just magically I uh, magically appear with them all. Mm-hmm. So at that point, you do have, I, you're now looking at the idea of a of a location that's and you're not just simply going. I have one guy who goes out in the woods and picks some berries and some twigs, and then milks it and, and, and then milks some you know milks a spider. And now I got all the parts for my poison slash potions that I now give to right. everybody. No, you're now having the idea of there's an actual supply chain that's now being developed mm-hmm. to mass produce 10 to 15 potions especially when, you know looking at each potion taking a day several days to manufacture for a certain price and there are rules out there for, to do this but now you're looking at the idea of there's a, that that there are hidden locations now where somebody has actually invested all the time money and and energy is to create what is in essence a cottage poison slash potion manufacturing center to create these alchemical fine <laughs> these alchemical so as you're adventuring oh orcs are all stupid and goblins are all stupid they're all savages until you realize that, that, that there's this vast actual like 
hidden farmland of shamans who are sitting here busily working up these potions and manufacturing them in job lots and then shipping them by crate almost so that way you can equip your your orcish assault teams because honestly they can't all just have them for you know in the event of player characters break break glass take out potion drink it no this is now their standard you're, you're going to assume that, that the encounter you're encountering in a world that's actually persistent is now this is a standard procedure for them because I'm sorry, player characters don't have a big giant giant sign sign over their over their head saying player character, player character. No. As far as the the monsters are concerned, they're just the players are another random encounter. And if their random and if their standard if their SOP is pop potion of heroism charge into combat, that means these potions are now in general production general uh, general assignment that if everybody pops one and everyone's got a healing potion everyone's got a buff potion everyone's got you know certain things on them then that is now standard equipment and everyone's got it in their toe um you're going to go out there and somebody is manufacturing it and now you have a major plot point because now you have to figure out and you guys also got to calculate how many people have this how fast are they manufactured what is their engagement rate? How, what is their what is the rate of expenditure of these potions? How much is being manufactured by? What's the tooth tail ratio you're uh, you're developing here? So how many orcs do I? Uh, how many orcs are now in the supply chain producing the potions and the, the potions and poisons and alchemical devices that are you're now equipping your your frontline encounters because this, because obviously this encounter might not be you know that the part of a much faster tribe is every tribe got this buff are they all equipped with this thing sorry i'm used to playing in guilds and in, in mmos where this was the kind of thought that process that we all we all went into so at this point you might have just for the alchemical side you might have hundred you know gatherers farmers Herdsmen who are creating your animals that are uh, uh, your animals. You have secure locations of guards. Now you're looking at like five, six people for every you know manufacturing for days on end to manufacture one, two potions. You got to do this weeks on end so that way you can give your ten man orc squad their potions of heroism so they can go into combat buffed up. So now you're gonna like now you're thinking about you know, well they're out there raiding for slaves to do what pick fields. Do you trust slaves to pick your fields of your vital strategic resource that's allowing you the buff to be able to conquer the humans? No, you're going to put trusted individuals into this. You don't want to trust slaves who are going to backstab you, dirty freaking humans. Ugh, God, I don't want I, I don't want humans just dis, dis, disrupting my production schedules. No, I want trusted individuals of my tribe producing my critical resources. I have humans that do all of my menial labor. Critical strategic resources, unfortunately, are what I'm doing here. And yes, if you have a, an orc, an orc or two out there with a 13 or 14 intelligence, they are thinking this way. And if your goblins are thinking with a 12 or a 13 intelligence, they might be thinking this way. And they're not just simply going, rape, I rape them, kill them, put, I put idiots in. I, I trust my elves, my elven, my elven captives to manufacture my super, super. No, especially if you have entire squads who are popping potions and buffing before combat. You are now welcome. I, I welcome to the idea that there's probably there probably is somewhere like the the hive from Resident Evil of evil manufacturing, condensed and fortified and secured, and your and someday your pleasure to raid a location built exclusively to do this one thing and that is to equip armies with potions entirely possible sorry i put way too much uh, way more thought into way more thought into this than the usual i give random treasure to my to my encounters and enc encounters now awesome no there's, there's logic on why everything happens so sure and I was just—I was being pretty generic, and, and you know, just to give an, a rough idea of 
oh, you know, if I was a player and you did that to me, you better believe my brain would have gone to that level of detail. And now I'm on a hunting, killing, like a hunter killer task force idea of now our job is to destroy that facility and probably not, probably not kill them, but kill all their overlords and then hire all of their potion makers. Going, hi, orc potion makers. You are now going, I will now pay you better than the orcs are. You know, I, I, I thought about that, them. but the, my my uh, general idea would be uh, that different creatures with different physiologies doesn't mean that a potion works for one species works for another. You know what I mean? I, I could we could easily retool the entire manufacturer. Plus, if I have a healing potion, if my healing potion works on work, that, 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 that's how you trust me. We have trial and error testing. And if we have to, we'll retool the entire facility. And they have the skills. They've got to retool the facility to get to handle all the humanoids. And they're humanoids, too, because half orcs and orcs use the same buffs and potions that we do. So it should work. And if not, well, we'll retraining and, re and reallocation of resources. And if I have to clear out, the, their tools will still be useful if I, if, if I put humans down there and working in the pits. Uh, two things really quick, shout out before we move on. A crafty gamer had his hand up. Then after okay. he's done, I I have a I want to comment really quick. All right. Well, PCG, what, guys, what you got? guys rant. Okay. Uh, guys rant reminded me of something I did in a game that would definitely fall under. Well, maybe not, but it does kind of under the potion category. I had uh, murder hobo players, which is quite common for the games I was playing. So to deal with that, I didn't want to deal with that like the like how they were doing it. I gave a band of orcs through religious rites cocaine, which was I made it basically the equivalent of a berserk potion. I mean, okay. he's not wrong. I like this idea. Hmm. They they didn't just like I I made it. I actually thought way into this. They didn't just. They actually ate it and actually did have a were fine for snorting. They also used it as part of their war makeup. Like it was a full on religion with the stuff. Okay, that gives me ideas for two different things, but that's 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 all right. I'll work those thoughts out later. Yeah, it's but just I really wanted to say, me, like, I wanted to throw this out about uh, potions because we're slightly talked about. It. But what if you're running an evil campaign? Or you and somebody in your party wants to be uh, a lich. Well, the party, the good guys who are facing your bad guys, back in the day were able to throw healing potions at the undead vampires, lich, and all the other undead, and do uh, damage to them. Sure. This has been removed from the game, which is dumb in my opinion. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, well, it's, it, to me, it's kind of dumb on both counts because if you're if you're, you know, if, if the only recourse you have is to throw your healing potions at the bad guys, you might want to get the hell out of there because you're not necessarily supposed to win every encounter. Running away is actually usually kind of a, a, a really smart idea. You know, you're, you're, you're not. No, and I get what you run away. Everything you come across. It's a, a quick, uh, quick uh, decision making. Okay. What exactly. would happen if we throw a health potion at the lich? I'm melting, I'm melting. What the fuck? As you're running away. Yeah, that's like Major said, that's what holy water's for. And or um, you're only going to do a limited amount of damage. You know, uh, I, I would guess, you I know, it was roughly what it heals. Maybe even if you got double, you know, double what it heals, uh, you know, for a against the lich, you're still looking at needing, you know, to do, you know, 60 some odd more points of damage and if you're not equipped you know you have to also count for misses and things like that you might want to rethink that whole strategy of taking on the lich the first time you bump into a lich so i'm gonna go into question number three uh tcg i'm gonna start with you uh because that's how i'm rolling going clockwise yeah. uh formation um Hopefully we can make it through this one with uh, everybody getting a chance. And if Baron would like, we can come back next week uh, with the last two questions, or maybe we can post them in Discord for folks to see. But TCG, what are some tips for designing unique and interesting poisons and potions, and how can game masters and players use these items 
to create a more immersive and flavorful game world. Never be afraid to, to use something that you think is crazy. Now, I don't mean comical. I mean like, uh, oh, here's a good example. Something that paralyzes specifically the left foot. I don't know why you would do that, but don't be afraid to do something outrageous like that. Because if you're, especially, if, oh, in this case, especially if you're looking just to ki not to kill a person, but immobilize them, paralyzing their feet is a good way to stop them. And I know that's very specific, but there are some poisons that target specific things. Like there, are, there is a you're absolutely I correct. creature. It, I forgot what spider it is, but there's a spider that when you get bit, it doesn't paralyze your your entire body. It just paralyzes your limbs. And Flady says, "Remember, most of most of your aquatic creatures' poison should be nearly fatal every time." Yeah. Oh yes. Aquatic poisons are scary poisons. Mm, so, fish. so mm, num, num, just num, never num, be num. afraid to uh, use the extreme or strange. Like I said, just try not to make it comical, though. Like I haven't had to deal with that because not too many players. I actually have no players that ever played with poison. But uh, I could see how if you're not if you're allowing that, it could quickly become comical if you're not careful. Okay. Uh, Connell, how about you, man? Make your health potions addictive. <laughs> and after a while, they no longer heal you, but do damage instead. Um. Yeah, that 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 to me sounds. Uh, counterproductive to having a, a normal run-of-the-mill kind of game. Maybe, you know, if uh, the potions are coming from a particular source, I can see that as being a thing. But, uh, you know, for general purposes, otherwise the players are going to be like, well, you know, uh, but time to retire. You say, but didn't you say earlier that one should not rely on health potions, you know, alone? They should be able to Figure things out. Sure, so but what about make, the party? What about the party that just doesn't want to have a cleric or a, a dedicated? That's not cleric? my problem as a DM. That's their choices. They're they're all you know choices were made. They made a bad choice. Well, so now well, like, while I agree with most of what you just said, I'm not going to tell people what to play when it comes to the characters. If they you know decide they do not want you know one of the four food groups for whatever reason, you know I. I I'm not going to, you know, penalize them and make them feel like they always have to have one. But at the same time, they are going to try to, you know, keep going through the game. And healing potions, doing what they say, is kind of uh, one of those rules I don't want to break just because that doesn't leave them any other option other than to right. you know, right. well, uh, well, bring in. Different. Now you got to bring in a cleric, you know, or a healer of some sort. Uh, because, it, you know, every once in a while it might be nice to have one of those weird, you know, not necessarily weird, but, you know, like a Three Musketeers kind of party where there's no magic users, there's no no clerics. It's just a bunch of fighters, you know, out on the town, you know, doing I fighting get, stuff. And I get what you're saying, but it's like water. You're supposed to drink X amount of uh, glasses of water per day. Well, if you drink too much water, you can make yourself sick. And well, you, water, yeah. water is a source of life, right? I have not gotten there yet, but I know what you mean. So Just you got a party there. that wants to be, you know, wants to be uh, whatever, and no one wants to be the hill bug. I'm not going to punish them by making the health potions addictive. I'm just saying, uh, was it meth was a medical, you know, uh, a drug that the doctors, so was cocaine and a bunch of other stuff yep. uh, throughout the years. I thought, you know, gave healing abilities. So... Maybe you should go El Natural next time you're thinking about, you know, I need to help uh, uh, bump up my health or find a way to even out the uh, potion addiction. Maybe uh, eat some poison to uh, measure it out. I, I don't know. I haven't got I think there. It's a, I think it's a bad idea, but. I mean, your games shouldn't be. No game should be cut uh, cu uh, cookie cutter games. Kai games well, but they, they, they're barons, also, barons and so forth and so on. You know, so uh, if I make my game where health potions after a certain degree are addictive, maybe the party needs to figure a different way of maybe running away so that they don't get hit so damn bad. 
I mean, didn't you just say that, you know, running away is always a good option? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're muted, Barry. But I, I can see where some people might think that's that's kind of a, you know, kind of like putting the game into, you know, super hard mode. Um, Baron, you look like you got something to say. Otherwise, well, you're, uh, the, you're next. The the uh, the one thing on on Connell's, I could see it being tied into something where they get some kind, either the rations or something like that, had some type of additive to it uh, that maybe comes from their patron, because maybe their patrons are not all not totally on the up and up. Mm-hmm. Who knows? They could be working for, for the big bad. Who knows? Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, each each you, each game does need, if you're going to do something along those lines, normally I'm not one to holler about balance, but I would state that it would probably not be in the best idea as a GM to implement something that harsh just for the simple fact of they can still go to the old local temple, pay a few gold and, and they, they, they can ha- have, have a come to come to God meeting and, and they hailed and, and everything else. And then they're all better because at that point you start, you know, you know, at what point does that, reset because maybe they're not addicted anymore after they're healed who knows but you know go go into to mind you know if you're going to have unique things within either nature or whatever you know there are several different ways to implement that there you know yes the players are not always going to win every battle. They're going to maybe walk into a portal where this blue dragon tells them to drop all their magical shit and get the hell out. And they're going to be dumb enough to attack it. And then Bruce has a half TPK. Things happen. So, you know, that's, that's the thing is that, you know, the, there are going to be things that are going to be to come up. You can implement them into your game, uh, but you know, and, and I agree. Make them interesting. Don't, don't, you know, if it is you in a group that you've played with for a while, and you guys have an inside joke, I see no issue with throwing in something as an inside joke, because. Everyone at the table is going to get it. That's fine. You can go a little gonzo with that. That's perfectly fine. Some people may not agree with me on that, but that's the thing. Is that, you know, sometimes you need to throw that levity in. But your your table may vary. So as long as everybody at the table is enjoying your story, enjoying the gameplay and at the end of the night able to walk out and say god damn i can't believe we did that you know that that's like the big overall arc of what you should be looking at within your game gotcha Bruce, you there? I am here. Oh, All right. Would you, would you like me to reread the question or? Yeah. Please. Okay. Please, sir. What are some tips for designing unique and interesting poisons and potions? And how can game masters and players use them to create a more immersive and flavorful game world? I would recommend that while you're quote unquote still in your apprentice stages of uh, the game, unless the player is literally angling to be a potion maker, don't let them involve themselves with that. Let the, the clerics and the 
alchemists at the temples handle that. Let the, the guys at the vendors handle that. Um, what I would do at the start of the game is if, uh, if they're bumping into things that drop ingredients, it would be a smart idea to kind of notate which characters would kind of see that and have a value for that. So say like you kill a start of the game, you manage to get a lucky few shots on an owlbear. And one of the players is like, man, I would love to take this owlbear's corpse back and uh, give it to my, my mentor. Because I, I know he, what? Fluffy. Yeah. And so we haul this 800 pound corpse back on a, on a wagon. The horse is going nuts the entire time, not really liking the fact that you've got a mostly dead owlbear hanging off the, the, the boards. And the wizard tells you a few things, maybe around level three, you start seeing a value for, uh, Albear feathers or uh, as sounds the albear, so you can possibly start knowing what you need to field extract or what you need to field prep in order for you to take it back to uh, senior mentor so he can outfit you for the game next time a little better than what you were today. And then maybe around level six, that's where for me. Level six is where uh, options open up in a game. They should be open all the time, but around level six, like you have real options like, um, do you want to stay this class or do you want to try to start getting yourself angled into a prestige class and, and do something more focused and be a magician? Maybe you wish to be more like an invoker or maybe you wish to be like a summoner type. I don't know. And start offering that. And, and then you start offering whenever you have any sort of foraging or any sort of loot said corpse, you start putting notations in there like, yeah, and along with the uh, full set of adult owlbear teeth that you find, there's also 70 pounds of owlbear meat, which is untainted by the digestive tract, which released at the moment of death. And therefore, you... Tommy, you, you've got an alchemist, right? First level? Okay. Um, give me a knowledge arcane roll. Okay, so you rolled a 24. Um, what you get, Tommy, is that for every five pounds of this meat you can distill, that's another amount, that's another serving you could use to help make a potion of owlbear health, which will increase your constitution by four for a limited time, it'll also drop your wisdom by two if you want it. And and you let people have those sort of things. I mean, you give them the potion recipe and around, you know, the middle levels is where the players start being able to focus their, their talents to where they can actually do things on a reliable die roll. I would prefer to do that. And I would, I would allow them to start kind of experimenting with stuff by initially first giving them like the list of items from felled creature. Maybe you get a troll's severed arm and then you burn it at the, the shoulder so it doesn't regrow, regrow a whole new troll on you. But you take that severed arm back to the wizard and maybe he tells you exactly what you use this troll for or the remainder of the troll for. That sort of thing. And I would I would like, you know, as, as time goes on, you start giving out like detailed taxidermy lists from the said corpses. And the game turns into almost like a monster hunter when you're doing that because now you can tie each and every specific bit of a slain creature or animal into like a specific quest item or spell component. And you can do those sort of things with the game if you so choose, but after a while it does get a little tedious and it feels like farming. If you don't mind farming, there's your campaign for two or three levels, i.e., 10 to 12 adventures, 10 to 12 sessions. And I, I mean like six to eight hours per session. I think you can you can reliably do that. And you're, you're doing that not all at the same time, but you can split that up throughout your whole campaign. 
And that can be quite rewarding for the players because maybe they find something like uh, Essence of uh, the Medusa where uh, you, you take the head off of Medusa and after you pluck her eyes out, you can safely, not safely, you can almost reliably extract the poison from the snake heads. But that's if you so choose to do such a thing. And then you can use the poison from the snake heads to either uh, tip your, your arrows in that, or you can you know, use the eyes of the, the Medusa and give them to a, a wizard, and maybe he can make a stone to flesh spell that actually is 200% more effective than the standard flesh to stone spell. So things of that nature. But with, with the, the game as it is, what I really appreciate is the ability to actually customize things after you've set some ground rules. You don't do things gonzo at the start. You just drip feed them in slowly but surely. And by around 12th or 15th level of the campaign, the players should have a really good idea of what you allow and what you don't allow. You know, in the back of my head, Bruce, when you were talking about the uh, merchant vendors, I can just see him coming out with like, this potion will give you haste. All right. What really is it's speed. And the rogue in the background that's normally bouncing off the walls is now sitting down. It's like, hey, guys. Because Raylan, I mean, speed's just really Raylan if you have ADD. Um, Kai, you're muted. Oh, yeah, very good, a very good quality of speed, too. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Kai, I gotta, I gotta ask, like, whenever you guys are doing um, your adventures, is, is there a moment where when you describe an encounter, and I apologize, Shadow, is there a moment where you describe an encounter where, like, your players start piping up, man, if we survive this, we're going to have a hell of a loot list because they start listing off all the ingredients or all the special essences or extracts that they can farm off this one particular encounter. Have you ever done that? <laughs> I'm in a campaign where that's allowed, but no, I've never done it as a DM. Okay. Oh, yes. Because I run, I run very, very heavy crafter. I focus games. Um, yes, they are already planning out. We're going to kill it, skin it, use find what I process food. I meat for I flesh into food, skin into leather. Sc, I scales and teeth. Blood will be collected. Bones will be harvested. I, I, I venom sacks or chemical I chemical glands will be used for uh, if it can breathe fire or any kind of a, a thing. They'll figure out what it is. They will they will process and render this thing down to there's only some grizzle left over for native life to to to, to decompose with, and they will walk off with vast tracks of it. And then they will like because they waste they will go into waste nothing mode. So. Monsters are just I monsters are just things you encounter and destroy and tear apart. They go into extreme amounts of it. They're like figuring out how much meat per day that we're di I'm I they'll figure out how much meat per day for the diet we can actually process, figure out how many rations we can proceed from that, how we're gonna smoke it. They will stop and like re like I've had my party stop adventuring for like after a major wildlife encounter and then spend two three four days just working on the body like like army ants until it's gone because it and they will have like like the, and they will send sending spells off to merchants saying hey i've got dragon bone or i've got a basilisk scales in in bulk they're already pre i pre-selling i i pre you know working out who they're going to sell all their materials to before they get back to town. And when they get back to town, it's, it's really just delivering resources off to various people. It's a, it's an industry. It, I, and then when, and but the, then I watch the new players who, have, who don't know what they're doing come in and go, what the hell are you people doing? I thought all we do is collect a pile of, you know, we got, you know, 2D6 um, times 10 coins and some and a gem from under its scales. And, 
and which put my players go, you have no idea how much money you're just leaving on the ground to rot, my friend. The moral of it's the story like, is don't leave money on the table. Yeah. And well, because of the fact it's like and if and it's like because like the GM the, the GM is a spendthrift and a, and, a, and, a, and a fucking cock blocker in terms of treasure, so we make our own treasure. Because we only got 30 gold pieces for, all, for half of us almost dying. Oh, fuck no. We're going to sell it. Uh, we're going to walk back to town with several hundred gold in, in materials. Fuck, the, like, fuck just leaving that body. Like, if we could fucking find a way to, like, to, to, to flinch the flesh off of humanoids and, and, and resell it, we would. Because every dime fucking counts. And, and everything's expensive. And the GM, the, the GM ain't handing us free money. And if, if we don't work for it, we don't get it. And the GM threw a counter on us. We're gonna fucking pull teeth and sell shit. I mean, not, if we could, if you're if you, if you have anything valuable in your body, we will fucking sell it, and, or turn it into a potion, or turn it into a poison, or or just sell off uh, sell off flesh. We don't care, and we're efficient at it. <laughs> that wasn't a monster. That was a uh, that that was a grocery store that just ran by. See, see, I'm thinking. I, I can only think when you describe that of that one campaign that Bruce was telling us about with the, the on the mountain where the uh, the, the harassed, harassed has been pinned to the wall by thirteen artifact javelins. Yeah, yeah, and they were just cutting c- cutting me off that thing forever. Oh yeah, yeah. regenerating. Oh man, if if you give us a regenerating monster, oh hell yes, that's just. <laughs> That is just infinite fucking shit, man. That that game is called Salt in Wounds. It's I know. Uh, that and, and, the thing is, is that, and the thing is, is that it's like, oh, you don't even need a terror ask. You just need to find a creature that regenerates, and at that point, you just bleed it dry constantly, and then spit spit it like, man, infinite water, infinite materials, infinite proteins. Yeah, but the problem is, you really can't live near it because, like, water will get foul close to it. Oh. Hey, have a good evening, my friend. I, we don't see the Terrasque is too hard to trap. Trolls, on the other hand, are much easier. To I find. was just thinking trolls. <laughs> trolls are much easier to find. And you know what? If I go down to the soundproof, scary basement full of terror and uh, terror pains and sobbing, because you know what? We need more. Wa- I we need more plasma so that way we can turn it into water. And you know what? You guys just suffer horribly. Please kill us, no. No, you're going to kill my entire town. We captured you. Now we have an infinite well. It's made of blood. Now we process the blood. Don't worry about that. Trust me, we separate out the blood from the water and the plasma. Don't worry about it. You're useful now. Please kill us. No. I love how you said we're you're useful now. <laughs> please, please just give us back our computers. That's yeah. all we want is our computers. The movie that came no out. No trolls. Old. No, you rush. You Russians deserve to sit in this basement, chained, bleeding for all eternity. For all called? eternity. People underneath the stairs. You will. You will get a water and bread diet forever, just enough so you don't. You don't die on me. Wow. You know don't, the problem. Don't okay. lose. Just don't lose. I was in a campaign where this guy had a pet dog and a dog bit the troll when the troll was dead. Then like six weeks later, a new freshly born troll came out of the dog. I See, I love when GMs do that. It's like, oh, if you don't burn the troll, it regenerates. From, and at that point, I go, oh, my God, you have me. You have an infinite source of material to work with. And I. And especially if I'm playing like like a Zemitsi light flesh crafter, I'm like, this is the greatest thing in the entire universe, GM. You've given me infinite play toys. So I could you have a troll's head mounted on a torch and I think so. just have it scream as you carry it through a dungeon? <laughs> I would love that. That would be amazing. <laughs> The fire I, only does a D6 damage, and if it heals back constantly. <laughs> I mean, I would like to think that eventually the fire would make its way in, up into the skull and break You know what? Pure, break hey, down. remember, if, a, if the troll can regenerate from a fingertip, it will wow. burn. It's like, 
I will happily test, like, man, this is only doing a D3 fire damage. It regenerates more than that. So is the, <laughs> is, so is the DC character Lobo a troll then? Because he can uh, probably come back no, from a blood. His, he's, his mutation is just regeneration. That's all he's got. Or his, that's his power. But no. So, so okay. So right. Don't you don't other Oh, don't. no, wait. We just got to find a different source of, of pain and suffering that illuminates. Perhaps a couple say, sun rods in its eyes. Perhaps, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all. I it, it's screaming because it, because it, you know periodically we got to sit there and you know crank the um crank the the screws in the eyeballs so that way they they keep screaming. I, I want to intimidate everybody else in the dungeon that, that look we're here to retrieve one thing. Don't get in my way. Don't so get in our way. You more or less made a. Aztec death whistle. Yeah, you you could you could plant the flare spell anally on a troll, and then put him on the front of a chariot or like a juggernaut, and just let him chug through the the dungeon wailing. My bad. I part that's me, terrible. I'm sorry, of, kids. Part of me doesn't. I, part of me wants to ask a question: Are they D and D trolls, which are big, stupid, uh, stupid, and useless? Or are they Warcraft trolls, which are actually cool? If they're Warcraft trolls, I don't want to do that to them because they have personality and culture and elegance, and they're kind of cool. When and not all of them have are, are Jamaican accent, uh, um, you know. Maybe. But hey, what mages have a good night, my friend. So if you give them like you know, but they're big, just dumb, dumb D and D trolls. Yeah, you torment these fuckers. So I, I have, I have some, I have some standards here. Remember, lacking ethical oversight. If you ever ask what I'm doing, remember, <laughs> lacking ethical oversight. Um, I, I think with with the comment earlier about the troll that got eaten by the dog, I yeah. think for like days leading up to the, the troll ripping out of the dog, I think that you would probably have like signs that the dog is not feeling well, the dog has not moved, the dog is whimpering in pain. Um but there's there's something there's a parasite in the dog. I think, um, I, I, I think the dog's digestive acid should actually counter all of that. To be acid honest. does not stop trolls; only fire does. Actually, acid does per the a lot of game rules. Oh, yeah. So the way he did it was only fire. The only thing you would actually do fit, uh, stop it from. Uh, not to mention, I don't want to go down as the DM that kills players' dogs. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I would. would. I want to say I would do it with a German accent. Duh. DCG, I want to say, yeah, a little, something, to say something. A little something about Kai's rant about a uh, group making uh, 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 industry out of out of uh, the game. Yes. I had two character. I had uh, two sets of players do that like different times. Mm -hmm. One set of players found out because I, I said this before one set of players found out that um firework uh that not fireworks a uh, gunpowder was invented before fireworks because of the dwarves and one of the guys got the clever idea well i'm going to invent fireworks then and made an entire industry and empire off of just fireworks alone hey more power to your players at that point that's awesome and number two which was relevant to this i uh a play a group of players found out that dragon shit could enhance potions and so they actually Ooh. seeked out a great horn dragon and basically made a deal for its shit keeping its claved cave clean in exchange for shit don't say that bruce is in the panel fuck and we know how he <laughs> feels about shit <laughs> hey, what, what you don't realize is that dog that 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 ate that bit that that the the owner's name was John Wick. <laughs> yes, uh, I, thought, it I thought his was... name was Johan. I thought he was <laughs> Johan Vick. <sighs> it, it doesn't matter. And I then know. and then he chases down <laughs> the troll that could butt it out of him like the alien. You know, and yeah. Uh, I, I know that the DM 
played uh, Warhammer Fantasy before he dove into uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So the darkness was already there. And he just amplified it when he went into uh, 3.5. I, but I, the moral I mean, of the story is drugs are bad. Don't do poison. <laughs> unless, unless it comes from people like Sammy Adams' Oktoberfest, which is technically a poison. And I recommend if you're of age, of age, 21 and up, at least here in America, go get one. It's a really tasty poison. If you're in Europe, Sam Adams is not a, a, a uh, beer commercial. not a... A, a, a neither, neither a commercial nor sponsor of the stream, any uh, anything to that effect that needs to come back on the panel of the Scar DM, uh, Baron G Rock Enterprises does not uh, does not uh, console uh, and or dictate anything that that Connell says, and therefore uh, uh, the, the, the there we go. Ah. It had to happen once during. It has to happen, happen <laughs> once during every single thing. So yeah. <laughs> hey, look! It fixes blue. He's not blue anymore. No, oh, just give it time. <laughs> All right. So I think that we'll go ahead and cut it there. We'll come back and we'll grab those other those other two next week. So, uh, Bruce, what do you got going on this week? Well, tomorrow night, if uh, you're familiar with my friend and panelist Janet from Another Planet, on Monday nights we do movie reviews on my channel. But on Friday nights, we kind of get in the weeds a bit, and I, I don't recommend everybody watch, but I think I think we're entertaining for the cadre we, we are going for over there. And I'm sure this week will be a lot of fun because of all the stuff that's happened in the last 36 hours. Um, the shit show at Janet from another planet YouTube site. I'll put that link in the chat in just a second. Saturday, running a game and looking for finishing this fire giant so I can add her to the group of fire giants that should beset the players and possibly put them in the, the dead book. Please don't end up in the dead book, players. So, Monday night, we're talking about hold on just a second. I know. I know there's a movie we're talking about Monday night. Of course. I'm in the wrong bracket. 1980s Dune. Yes. The yeah. Dune, 1984, David Cronenberg. But we're watching the Spice Diver edit. So Sunday on my Discord channel, if you want to swing by at 7 p.m., we're having a watch party for that. And then we'll be discussing on Monday night the Dune, 1984, Spice Diver edit. Which is a little different than the regular Dune movie, which is about an hour or two hours and ten minutes. This here is like two hours and fifty-eight minutes. It's it's ridiculously wonderful. It, and if you like if you like the Spice Diver edit, if you know what I'm talking about, then just show up there anyway. But if you are not familiar with it, if you want to see the the extended version of Dune with some fan edits in there, and I mean pretty high quality edits, I do recommend that. And that's my next four days. What about you, Crafty Gamer? What are you doing this coming weekend? Well, I'm probably not going to have the video I was planning. My I, my computer did not distinguish between this mic, sorry, and my new camera mic. And I don't really like the angle it's at anyway. And I got a bunch of crappy audio. It's got this weird buzzing sound. I think the camera picks up on my fans. That sucks. So I'm probably not going to have the video I was planning. All right. What about you, Shadwell and Jack? Well, uh, tomorrow uh, I'll be in uh, a game tomorrow night with uh, Bo Paints Minis, Omen Owl, Mark from Mark's Genre Mixer, and a few other gentlemen so i'll be pretty much indisposed i will probably put out my review of the dragon king's hardback book from dark sun tomorrow morning saturday of course i'll be doing the sci-fi shadow chat with uh, jackie at my side talking about eldritch horrors in sci-fi games sunday i will be 
probably doing a stream one on one with Omenau, uh tying up all my Dark Sun questions in one neat little package before I move on to some other things for the rest of September slash October. Next week, uh, it's going to be a lot of spaceships and Ravenloft. A whole lot of Ravenloft reviews for the rest of the foreseeable future, at least until Halloween. Other than that, you just have to wait and see. Check out the channel. All right. Kai, got anything interesting going on this weekend? Go go see a movie. Go grab a beer with a couple buddies. Don't know. Somebody needs to ask me, then I will probably do something. But oh well. Yeah. All right. Well, tomorrow I will most likely be off camera because I will be playing uh, Warhammer Fantasy with a group of friend uh, friends in Washington. Uh, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. I will be hanging out with Bruce and the rest of his Motley crew as we're taking on Giants. God, I hate Giants. And Sunday, yes, Sunday is a very special day. This coming Sunday, we're reviewing one of Shadow's favorite movies. It has Jim Belushi and John Ritter. Now, I got questions about this movie. And one of them is, what's up with John Belushi's dad? I got so many questions in so little time. The movie is Real Men. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. You can find it on YouTube. I think Bruce did a review on it a while ago. Yeah, but that's okay, because we did a review on Dune and the Crackhead Show movie that it is, because that movie. Wait, wait, which, which version of Dune? New the Dune? Normal, or... Oh, there's like three different versions of it. So there, we did Okay, one. there's one from 1984, which is Cronenberg. There's the 1999 or 2000 sci-fi version. Oh no, the old one, the original one. Okay, with David, the one that David, I thought it was David Lynch that uh, directed it. Yeah, it was Lynch. My bad. I was okay, yeah, we we did that one. Cronenberg would be an awesome version. Yeah, I know. I was like, is there a version I didn't know about? But no, it's David Lynch. Uh, I want the Cronenberg version now. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, if you don't know who David Lynch is, he is the one who. Directed at uh, Twin Peaks, which is an old 90s show that was kind of, it was just kind of something. Um, but yeah, we're doing Real Men. That sounds weird. We're reviewing Real Men. And I got questions because I think they miscast somebody and they should have put Bill Murray in it because somebody's acting like Bill Murray a whole lot. Uh, that's what I got going on. What about you, Baron? Anything special? I got nothing. Nothing. Uh, I might get pulled into uh, uh, the uh, the rando stream. I don't know, uh, but uh, I I will be around. Uh, yeah. Not, not that the rest of us are not worthy of it. <coughs> but I do want to congratulate you on a successful rando stream with a bunch of people i do appreciate watching those whenever i'm not like scrambling for topic uh information or for 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 a janet stream but you guys had a really good stream from what i heard and from what i got a chance to see it was enjoyable to watch it looked like max has actually got his dream panel and then the week following that he only had two of the two of the five guests that he wanted show up and i i was like ah I, i've been there yeah, the 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 one two weeks ago with with uh, Bear, myself, uh, Yo uh, Yo Geek, uh, who else is on? Mister Max Boivon, yep. uh -huh -huh. and then of course Vic. Uh, yeah, we we actually had had a had a good time with that one, and you know it was it was really we we really didn't step on each other. We really didn't uh, we. we you know, we 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 made a, we did little nitpicks at each other, but it was nothing that was like, you know, it, it was kind of like here. You know, we we all you know nitpick at each other. You know, we we do stuff like this all the time where we just kick Connell out just for S's and G's. No one ever notices when he's gone uh, because I, I'm sure he doesn't even notice that he's gone right now because he was looking at his phone and he's flipping me off. I can see this, uh, but yeah. He, uh, but you know, it's little things like that that you know, you know, and you know, we were sitting there talking about a few things, 
And one thing is, is like, is, is the same thing that, you know, I feel about this, you know, we may fight, we're, we're brothers, we fight, you know, but let what, let somebody screw with one of us. They have to screw with all of us. You know, we can screw with our own, but let someone outside screw with us. Mm -mm. No, sir. That ain't happening. So, so, so basically we're house merit. Yeah. You know, yes. Where is this? We're a dysfunctional family. Civil War time. This, okay, come on. <laughs> as dysfunctional as we may be, we're still a goddamn family. Yeah. Oh, not family. Yeah. Yeah, the only people who can fight House Spirit is House Spirit. And fuck anybody who tries. And you know what? I'm the redheaded stepchild, so fuck you all. Oh, goddammit. I, 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 I'll say I do it. Fuck like a line. <laughs> Where did I put my beer? All right, everybody. We're going to go ahead and call it a night. Uh, thank you much for joining us. We do uh, definitely appreciate it. Uh, make sure you do uh, do uh, join us next week when we're going to do part two of this since we didn't get all the way through it. And then uh, we'll actually next week, uh, TCG will be joining us again uh, because he'll actually be going over his game, which starts, starts the following week. So he'll walk us through a few things. And everything else. So we want to thank everybody, and we will catch you next week. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Night, everybody.